Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce Char here. He's talking about Ethernet as the next uh, storage fabric. Thank you, Mike. Um, I don't know what did I say, but we just lost half of the audience. So I, I want to believe it's because of the weather. Um, um, so my name is Shahar um, uh, Noy. I work for Marvell. Uh, part of my responsibility is what we call data center storage solutions. Whatever connect SSDs or HDDs into either a host or into a network. Um, and today I want to talk more about like, you know, how Ethernet evolving into like a fabric of choice for storage. If you think about, you know, NVMe, a lot of discussions, past discussions we had were a lot, a lot about how NVMe is going to influence the data center. But now when you guys start thinking how NVMe is going to scale, there is a new problem in terms of like how you connect NVMe effectively inside the data center. Let me, I get it right. No, I got it right. Now, um, first topic we would like to bring up, and again, there were a lot of discussions about NVMe, but many people, like maybe sometimes outside of for like, you know, the SSD industry or the SSD circle, know that right now NVMe drives in the enterprise or at the data center are outselling SaaS by a ratio of 2.5 to 3. So NVMe is already becoming kind of like the interface of choice inside the data center. Uh, we're at a point that in 2019, we believe we will sell more NVMe than we're selling SATA. So the challenge is if there's so many NVMe's drive coming to the market and we're all used to some sort of like a SATA connectivity or the classic HBA SAS expanders over SAS, what would be the right solution for NVMe? How do we expand storage using NVMe? If you look at how the industry evolved, right, the first all flash arrays, they just took all the building blocks that were available for them, the first extreme I.O. box, the first three-par box, they basically took a connectivity piece, a NIC, put a compute, put a DDR, and fan out SSDs, NVMe SSDs over a PCIe switch. It was, again, very available type of component set, uh, easy to glue together, but customers sort of banging on it, evaluating it, deploying it, and they say, hey, the cost of the backplane is very, very high. Every time we need to add another shelf of storage, we need another shelf of compute. And as you guys remember from the last year, DRAM was more expensive than compute. So the cost of the solution in some cases was between 30 to 50% of the cost. The cost of the backplane was 30 to 50% of the cost of the entire box. So it didn't scale very much. The next step, and uh, some of you heard maybe the term FBOF was the first step in terms of like composability, how we can take compute outside of the storage shelf. Um, so as you can see here, all, all the secret sauce that we used to put, give me a second, all the secret sauce that, that everyone used to put in, this, in the compute piece here was pushed into a separate shelf. There's now connectivity to the top of rack and connectivity down to a separate shelf using connectivity and compute. This is what some of you guys know as smart NICs. Um, and this was, I think this is start the deployment. We start seeing deployment of this type of an architecture a year, two years ago. And the feedback from the market was positive. Hey, we're saving some of the money here. We're not you know, getting stuck with some very big, very expensive X, x86. We like this concept. We can offload some of the storage services down here. And this concept have evolved, but still most of the customers coming back to us and say, we want to be at the SAS expander cost. We want to have a SAS HBA plus SAS expander type of like a, a bill of material when we go and expand NVMEs going forward. So the EBOF concept evolved. I don't know if you guys have ever heard about EBOF. Uh, uh, this is a term that I think uh, we, I discussed about in a couple of like different, different forms. It's like Ethernet bunch of flash. The differences between this, this is a fabric bunch of flash. This is uh, Ethernet bunch of flash. I'm just trying to justify my salary and come up with more kind of like sexy names. But the appeal here is that you no longer have PCIe other than the SSDs, and we will get into that in a second. You no longer have PCIe fabric in your storage shelf. You don't need compute. You don't need DRAM. You still have access to compute. It's outside. It's a true disaggregation of like a compute from storage. Now, the way to enable Ethernet switch is to create NVMe over fabric SSDs. And there's two ways to enable those NVMe over fabric SSDs. You can take NVMe with some sort of a bridge that will encapsulate, decapsulate all the transport that comes in, whether it's like a TCP, whether it's like RDMA, 
Or you can create an NVMe over fabric drives. So the drives will know how to talk Ethernet outside of their interface. If you look into the work, the SFF work in 9639, if you look into the uh, TA-1002 or 1007, there's already definition of like Ethernet pins inside the SSD. So now just for the industry to create, basically to enable Ethernet access to the drive and enable Ethernet access into the box. Now the major benefit here, and there's like a couple of benefits, is that now the throughput to the box is, the, is pending the Ethernet switch. It's no longer pending the connectivity in the compute. So if you look into RNICs, if you look into SmartNICs, even today the most advanced ones, they're, they're capped at 200 gigabit per second here. You can add more of those, but then you, again, you add more compute, you add more power consumption, you add more cost. With an Ethernet switch, um, some of the announcements this, uh, this week was about 12.8 terabit switch. So 6.4 terabit can go into the box and 6.4 terabit can, av can be available to service more drives. The other key advantage is that you can basically take all of this um, architecture and now you can start scaling those eBOFs one behind the other. You no longer need to have separate like, you know, connectivity of every box. Remember, all flash array, every storage box shelf that you add, you have another top of rack port being wasted. Same here, like you need to deploy more and more kind of like of the same architecture and use more connectivity up to the top of rack. In this particular case, you can daisy chain more shelves, more eBOFs behind the first ethernet switch. Very similar to SAS, the way you expand SAS today was like cabling over one HBA. So we're trying to replicate, like the concept here is like how do you replicate, how do you take the SAS, the, 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 the scalability of SAS, the cost of SAS, and bring it into NVMe. Now to show you some of the advantages and disadvantages of this, of this concept, if you look again into eBOF, the only connectivity piece that you use is NVMe over fabric and Ethernet switch. This is how simple is the backplane. It means significant cost reduction, significant power reduction. This is all the elements that you need to connect into a PCIe um, uh, uh, backplane or PCIe infrastructure. If you look into how much Ethernet is capable of the throughput compared to the switches, it's magnitude, order of magnitude more. You can put, if you think about EDSFF, right? Like if you think about, hey, let's use 2U EDSFF, it's 72 drive, right? Anywhere between, depends which vendor you talk to, can be anywhere between 64 to 72 drives in a 2U in an, with an EDSFF form factor. You cannot fan out 72 drives with a PCI switch. It has its own limitation. You can do it through an ethernet switch. From a latency perspective, because we're talking about network, those are roughly the rates as opposed to kind of like having no network, like in a direct attach, you basically don't pay the transport latency penalty. But this is, I think, the most interesting metric is that the entire IOPS, you can expose the entire IOPS of a storage shelf over an ethernet switch. You cannot do that with a PCIe. There's limitations that compute DDR piece that, that limit you from hitting those numbers. If you have the chance, and I'm not being paid by Toshiba, but if you walk through the Toshiba uh, booth, you will see they're demoing 15.6 million IOPS out of a 2U24 shelf in a computeless uh, EBOF. Um, um, and this is, and they're like almost kind of like getting, hitting, hitting the, the maximum theoretical throughput of what can be done in a 24. But think forward, again, EDSFF, you want to put kind of like QLCs coming. You want to maybe deploy, replace HDDs with QLC and use 4U chassis to plug more drives inside. This is, how, this is the flexibility that an Ethernet switch will enable you as opposed to the limitations we have on a PCIe switch. Um, in an Ethernet switch, you can eliminate the, the, the effect of oversubscription. You can have as much throughput to the network as the throughput you have to the drives. In the Toshiba demo, they're using 600 gig to the network and connecting basically 600 gig throughput of drives. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. You can expose all the drives to the network. You can expose the drives to any storage in the rack or any storage in the network that can basically scan those drives and use them. Something which is, again, very difficult to do with PCIe. And I mentioned the ability of like daisy chaining your boxes over the same Ethernet switch. So you connect one eBOF and then eBOF2 connect to eBOF1, eBOF3 connect to eBOF2. So you save on your top of rack um, um, switch. So 
If we look into the FX16, and, and I would assume you guys are familiar with the JBOF proposal or the JBOF architecture that exists right now in, um, at the OCP, the proposal is to have a one-to-one -one ratio between kind of like, you know, your, your, your um, JBOF, the existing JBOF. This is how much throughput right now you run over the 16 lanes of PCIe. Um, I'm, I'm a half storage person, half networking person, so I'm, I will talk gigabit in this uh, session instead of gigabyte. So you guys need to divide this uh, uh, by eight. But you always, the ratio is always a JBOF, like, you know, 16 FX16 drives connected into a compute head. If you look into our proposal, okay, what changes you need to do moving from PCIe, PCIe backplane into like an Ethernet backplane. So all of your SSDs are either NVMe over fabric SSDs or connected over a bridge. Going into an Ethernet switch instead of like a PCIe switch and getting into some sort of like initiator. It can be NIC for TCP, it can be RNIC for RDMA. The beauty here is that as you want to scale, with this diagram, you need to buy the same exact two shelves and expand storage. In this, can, in this case, we can just expand the storage shelves without the compute piece. We can actually put the compute in a completely different shell, in a completely different rack. We can keep the compute in the same rack. But think about the cost saving and the power saving that you can have in this type of an architecture. Here's another. Um, um, demo or like a concept that we were trying to, um, uh, to show to um, you know, a couple of like the, the industry players, like the big the hyperscalers or the um, uh, tier, tier two CSP. This is a typical rack that you have today if you follow all the, the OCP recommendations. You can have a head node connected to an FX16. You have some utility nodes either to run applications or to run extra storage services. And this is roughly the, the, the power penalty that you have in every box. Now, in this scenario, the assumption is that one head node can control more than one box. We want to create this disaggregation, right, the compo composability. So using the same amount of, like, uh, of shelves that we have, we're basically able to cut, like, cut the head nodes by half from 60 nodes. Just as an example, let's put eight nodes, and you can put less, you can put more, depends on your application. So right away, we freed up eight shelves for storage. So we're jumping from a 16 shelf of storage into 24 shelves of storage. So immediately within the rack, we introduce 50% more capacity. Facebook just paid a year ago $1 billion to build a new data center. We're saying, hey, have more gigabyte per square footage in your data center using this Ethernet architecture. So the first thing you get, you get 50% more capacity. The second thing you get, you get less power because you use less of the compute head nodes. The last thing is that even though we feel more storage here, the saving, again, that we have on the backplane, the saving you have on the compute element gives you a 20% of a lower rec cost. I know it's hard to believe because typically all of us in marketing, right, tells you that you can get more for less, you can buy a Tesla for one cent, right? But in reality, this is what we're seeing, this is what we're validating with our customers right now or with partners who are interested to explore more about the Ethernet as a fabric. So summary, Ethernet has many advantages. I think we walked you through some of those advantages. There's like many more. We mentioned the daisy chaining. Uh, we mentioned, I mentioned the option to connect drives over kind of like different geogra geographical areas. And the call for action is to collaborate, help us to collaborate and propose an EFX16, like an Ethernet based type of a JBOF and EBOF and even an EDX88. If you guys are not familiar with the DX88, it's the JBOD, uh, 88 drive JBOD that uh, uh, was proposed, I think, like two, three years ago? For how long we have the DX88 at OCP? Well, okay, um, um, uh, so we propose, again, same concept, put it over Ethernet. So again, from a host perspective, right, if you think about um, the OPEX that goes into data center nowadays just to develop software, so you develop the application, you put them above SAS and SATA, now you start developing above NVMe. What do you do? You keep maintaining your old SAS SATA, you keep kind of like developing only over, over NVMe. By putting Ethernet underneath and basically virtualizing all the drives, whether it's like spinning media, whether it's like, like SSD, we can expose everything up as an NVMe over fabric and talk over Ethernet. Um, we have technology demonstration at the Marvell booth and also at the, um, um, I mentioned, at the, at the Toshiba booth. And I appreciate your time today.
Um, any questions, or we were running off time? Time? Thanks very much for the talk. Something for nothing, I like it. Oh. Um, did you include or account for any incremental power for the termination logic that's going to be required in the SSDs when you did your kind of A versus B comparison? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can share some data um, around that. On the 600 gig demo that we have right now, the entire shelf, like again, we're getting 600 gig into the box, 600 gig into the drives. We have 185 watts at the backplane which is the Ethernet switches, the BMCs, and whatever make the conversion. Mm -hmm. If you take the same compute piece, I think we're talking 2x to 3x more in terms of like a power. So, so the power penalty, it, it depends on your design at the end of the day, I guess. It's very, very minimal. But you accounted for it, so yeah. that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, memory accesses over Ethernet? Um, memory access, uh, like byte addressable memory or like memory access in... C cache line accessible memory. Um, in, in so, so there is this Gen Z and C6, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, and I, s I think s somebody is promoting Ethernet also as a mm -hmm. uh, standard for the storage class memories. Correct. Uh, but Ethernet has latencies, packet mm -hmm. drops, those kind of issues, right? Cor correct. Um, what we see with Ethernet, and this is maybe talk more specifically to RDMA, um, I think Mellanox had some g great presentations on that, that you can, the minimum latency that you see with RDMA is like nine microseconds round trip outside of the memory, outside of the SSD. So it's all the boiled down to your application, right? If uh, you're not too sensitive to kind of like those type of latencies, because sometimes in memory you need to talk nanoseconds and not microseconds, then maybe over fabric is not the right solution for you. But if you have something which is more, I want to say read intensive and can leverage, can, can, can do well with like round trip of 20 microseconds, if you put Optane behind those type of solutions as an example, you're running at 18 microseconds round trip. So you can have storage class memory shelves, assuming the storage class memory can connect over, over Ethernet under, under the same concept and using the same exact fabric as, as, as defined today. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you.